Hello and welcome to this garbage. This is Spies vs. Mercs, the competitive multiplayer mode included in most of the Splinter Cell games, but I'm specifically focusing on Chaos Theory's version here from 2005, as it's the fan favorite ever since Double Agent and later Blacklist defied the mode's own genre-defying quirks into a uh, cover-based third-person action versus Iron Sights-based first-person action. But the original idea was to pit stealth against action. As future conflicts between these two groups of people escalated, the originally underpowered mercs got beefed up with one-shot kill guns and foolproof spy detectors, and spies got beefed up with x-ray see-through vision and insta-kill one-button melee moves as player counts increased to make more hectic matches. All of which kind of kills the point of the stealth tension pulled off in the classic 6th gen version of the game whose legacy lives on as one of the only places where an infamously, hilariously single-player style experience transfers over to multiplayer. But holy crap, this game has aged as gracefully as cable television. As cumbersome as hell, despite still being really flashy to look at. The lighting and shadow solutions here still look fantastic, but they're a testament that while graphical progress in games may have been slowing down, the basic readability and playability of AAA games has matured over the past decade in ways that are more than skin deep. Smart procedural animation systems, a focus on long-lasting competitive balance, readability, and conveyance were, uh all a lot more absent in 2005, which prodded these developers into a drastic solution even for that time. A mandatory series of lengthy tutorials explaining the basics of two very different but equally complicated exercises in game logic. See, playing as spies in this mode is incredible. It's an experience everyone should have at least once. It creates laughter and mischief. Playing as a spy is something that breaks the laws of typical action game multiplayer, but in order to make that work, you also got to play as the mercs. Which at first, feels more like an obligation than any kind of celebration. I mean, the mercs don't get night vision, they, they get this bullshit. The struggle of balancing mercs for low-level easy fun is what I imagine probably killed the creative energy for this mode later on. But first, you gotta get it set up. Did you know? You can still play Chaos Theory's multiplayer to this day. It's so easy. It's doable. Do you hate yourself but love interesting video games? Do you have three friends as miserable as you? If so, then the janky 12-year-old PC port of Spies vs. Mercs may be right for you and your gaming community of choice. First of all, buy a copy of Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, which often goes on sale for as low as four bucks, and launch the multiplayer mode at least once. This is mandatory. What's not are these tutorials the game makes you do. It's highly recommended to play through them, but you can technically skip them by just alt f 4 and relaunching the game if you like not knowing what the hell's going on. Once you're in the main menu, click back to the tutorials again and visit a map. Pick the mercenary team and load into the map, and you might say, oh no, the resolution's low, the frame rate's low, and most importantly, your flashlight does not work. I've linked a Steam guide underneath this video that'll help out with that flashlight fix. From now on, you'll be launching the game through an app called uh, 3D Anal, using the pictured options, and you can tick borderless windowed mode here for that, plus an unlocked frame rate. But be advised, hosting the game at high frame rates will cause problems for other players, so I'd actually recommend leaving that one off. The widescreen fix on PC Gaming Wiki works without a fuss, so hit that up while you're over there and gathering your three friends together. Did I say three friends? I meant three friends. No more, no less. Because Spies vs. Mercs is a 2v2 game. That's, uh, that's right. This game's action was designed to be quiet and slow enough to work between four peer-to-peer -peer players on a DSL connection circa 2004 through original Xboxes. Although I've had fun playing the game with lower player counts, and I'll get into that later, but for now, for trying to play the game as it's intended, whoops, sorry, you can't. This is why I think making bots is so important. Chaos Theory's multiplayer used to run on GameSpy, which has been shut down, and when Game Ranger relaunched to replace it, everyone forgot about poor old Sam Splinter Cell. Both of Chaos Theory's multiplayer modes are real lost gems. So what you gotta do nowadays is emulate a LAN through a service like Tungle, or what I've been using, Evolve. Download their client from their website, make an account, start adding friends, and make sure to install this network adapter middleware along the way. That'll make it pretend you're in a LAN network with anyone else inside these little chat rooms that Evolve calls parties. Once you and your three friends are all in an Evolve party together and have this online status checked, you're free to launch the game, open up a LAN match, and actually get going. In which case, you're done dealing with convoluted technology and now have to deal with convoluted game logic. So this game seems to be aiming to make classic single-player style stealth mechanics work against real human beings. 
The way it does this, though, is by forcing a lot of unconventional compromises on the FPS characters, while the spy characters pretty much play out like Splinter Cell normally does. Most evident, though, is that once you switch over to the other side and see what those guards are seeing, visibility and mobility is shot. Spies have a third-person camera that can peek over walls. They got night vision, thermal vision, but no guns. Just a puny little taser. Mercs have guns and grenades all right, but also a real lousy jump, a shuffled limp, a flashlight with about six feet of range, and two alternate vision modes that highlight threats, but, well, basically blind you. Those dynamics work really well with this game's lighting engine, which is another thing that's kind of gone out of style. The default lighting value of all of Splinter Cell's midtones is some pure pitch blackness, to the point where textures fade into models and render anyone hiding in there literally invisible. Thanks to those blinding vision modes and the mid-2000s obsession with pitch black dynamic shadows, actual stealth strategies work. You can blend into the darkness, move slowly, and even hide in plain sight, and that will all be enough to fool opponents. And that's something that I don't think you see a lot of games try these days. I mean, there's the ghillie suits in Battlefield and some basic flanking stealth going on in Siege. Dead by Daylight and Friday the 13th are the most similar modern analogs, but neither of which exclusively focus on stealth gameplay. The prospect of actually ghosting through a multiplayer match, oh, no, no, of even <laughs> non-lethal, no-tranking European extreming your way through a multiplayer deathmatch is something not a whole lot of developers have been tackling. You could have entire matches with no combat at all. The objectives wrangled between the two teams are flags to capture and computers to hack, not straight kills, and the game rearranges combat conventions accordingly. The only way spies can kill mercs is by jumping on top of them or snapping their neck from behind, both of which are extremely situational encounters that can never really be relied upon. Oh shit, he's right behind- wait. <laughs> of course! <laughs> You've been had. Actually, I lied. There's a third method. Objective to watch. Joke's on you, I've got a gap in there. Ah, shit. <laughs> Spies are better off just running away or pestering guards while a teammate captures objectives. So combat in Spies vs. Mercs more often ends with Mercs shooing Spies away from their goals rather than actually finishing them for the kill. In that respect, you may decide on a gentleman's agreement to never use the Merc shotgun or Uzi because they're OP as shit, and it's not like anything the Spies have is OP as shit. The Spies have a third-person camera with a wonky-ass control scheme. They got stun grenades and tracer darts that can hack into the enemy comms. Th that's another novel feature that you may never expect to see anytime soon again either. A gadget that lets you listen into the enemy team's microphones. Which actually made sense from a competitive perspective. With only two players on the opposing team, you only need one clue from their chatter to figure out where basically half the team is patrolling. So the name of the spy game is to sneak into the objectives the mercs aren't guarding. And with only two mercs to worry about, it's actually possible to make a good mental matrix charting what you think they're about to do. You either stay out of their way, send them elsewhere, or lure them into a grab or a gas bomb before making your moves. On the other hand, the name of the merc game is all about rotating between those objectives. You have about six to guard, and the spies only need to hit half of those. So you patrol from one objective to another, checking hiding spots along the way to narrow down their locations and get ready to ambush yourself into their remaining possibilities. But the problem of playing this mode comes from a feeling of artificial clunkiness. Your merc is so slow, so blind, and so underpowered, you're basically a mall cop. Meanwhile, spies aren't supposed to kill people at all, but they can climb stuff and see around corners. So I guess the game's really more like Batman's versus Paul Blart's. There's an idea for a Kickstarter. Meanwhile, the Batman are gonna miss security traps and alternate co-op routes during their first few sessions unless you play the spy tutorial version of each map as found from the visit a map button. It's highly recommended. And Jesus Christ, the developers made a lot of tutorials for this mode. What they knew, and what you now know, is that map knowledge and map design are the two critical pivot points that are going to support the whole prospect of you enjoying Spies vs. Mercs. Map design is more important than usual because it's part of the Spies mechanical toolset. Verticality has to be built into these maps to give Spies that overhead drop as a combat option. It's literally one of only two ways to kill enemies. Ha! <laughs> 
<laughs> Furthermore, the visibility and sight lines of the map have to be obstructed to give spies hiding places, and objectives have to be placed far away enough from each other to give spies a chance to capture them. So playing as Merc may actually be the better first time experience for learning a map, because spies have this spaghetti plate of vent shafts noodling their way to the objectives, and wherever those pipes dump you out isn't going to be obvious until you've squeezed through them a couple times. On the other side of the fence, Mercs have a screen full of waypoint markers, and since spies need about 15 seconds of total vulnerability to capture their objectives, there's usually about 20 to 30 seconds of clutter placed in a Merc's way of getting from one capture point to another. This is all very disorienting to manage in a way that visually makes sense, so it feels like half the maps are situations like this, which is evidently supposed to be a movie theater. Probably for aliens. It's a playable and fun map, but what the hell am I looking at? What, what, what is this place? What movie theater actually looks like this? Or you got situations like this factory, which looks fine. It looks like a factory, but the rooms and map size are actually too big and too empty to give the mercs enough time to cover it all. Remember, this is just a 2v2 game. Your partner being off in the woods cuts the whole team's efficiency down by half. So good spies versus mercs maps are smaller and more manageable and still have rooms clear enough for a quick glance at a room to be a sufficient check but they also have to have at least two floors of verticality to work as well. So the favorites are a Japanese bathhouse that stacks multiple floors of clean square rooms on top of each other, a kitschy aquarium with six very distinct rooms spiraling across multiple floors, and my favorite, River Mall. Half the reason being that there's at least one recognizable callout readily available. Video Games, the store that sells everyone's favorite video game, Video Game. On top of that, you also have the community-made map pack, which comes with a very helpful feature that's especially helpful nowadays. Alternate 1v1 versions of stock maps, which is actually a pretty enjoyable way to play the game. They basically decrease the objectives available for spies to capture, turning the constant stress and momentum of patrolling more points than you can cover into this funny and cerebral game of cat and mouse whack-a-mole. Here's some food for thought. The thought that the minimap, of all things, may have been the most significant revolution in competitive multiplayer over the past decade. Classic Spies vs. Mercs is desperately in need of a minimap, and room labels. This is a 2v2 tactical stealth game where efficiently communicating with your partner is critical, and having only two players means that being able to report the location of just one enemy is the kind of communication that wins matches. This is a lot like Rainbow Six Siege in many ways, and one of my favorite little things that game shipped with was a compass and room labels. They're not fancy features, but once they're gone, holy crap, you notice they're gone. In this situation, I can readily shout, We got a problem with video games. But what the hell am I supposed to say here? Oh, we got a spy in that hallway, that one, over that way, the one that's a hallway. I guess it's a combination of factors, and you just gotta look at an Overwatch level to see what they are. Clean, organized, and readable level design doesn't need a minimap. But, unfortunately, this is a game that needs a minimap. Also, alas, the standard definition of 2005 standard TV resolution leaves no space for such luxury. The buffer filling that map knowledge shortcut gap is just pure experience. But after about yeah, 10 repetitions of matches over the same map, some serious competitive depth, elegance, and diversity gradually came out to play. Starting with the extra thought and patience required to play it like a stealth game. Thanks to the game's lighting engine, its dark shadows, and the Merc's vision modes, this is probably the only place where you see cheesy stealth game tactics, like hiding in shadows directly in front of the guards, actually work. But Mercs can still straight up just check any shadows or corners with an insta-kill grenade. Not to mention their mines. Those supplies are limited and can't be refilled without dying though, which actually created strategies for non-lethal play from spies who will actually want to be keeping mercs alive but stuck without ammo. So the spies' combat options are so limited and indirect that they pretty much have to play this stealth game like a stealth game. Imagine that, right? It's possible for two spies to reliably circle around and choke out a guard, but the game's designed for most one-on-one -on -one fights to end with the merc victory. But spies do have enough intel, distraction, shrank, and tracking tools to reliably screw around with mercs. Which means that this is also probably the only place where you see cheesy stealth guard AI, where easily distracted soldiers walking in never-ending patrol patterns who blind themselves to obvious threats and quickly forget about alarms and combat is actually how real human beings and your dumbass friends are gonna look when they play this game. <laughs> Spies vs. Mercs turns everyone into a giggling schoolgirl, there's no exceptions. 
Every few seconds, you hear the sound of someone who couldn't believe their tactics ended up working. But to make those tactics work, the Mercs gotta be kind of a dumb, bumbling idiot. But after a few days of accepting that and working within all those limitations, Merc gradually turns into far more fun than those first few sessions suggested because of mind games, which started to become apparent after hour 9 or 10 or so. Once both teams learn the game enough to know what each gadget does, suddenly the two teams are bluffing each other. So once you get used to this, try playing as a stealthy merc. Spies are most vulnerable when they move out of their vent routes, and a merc lying in wait is far more deadly than a merc endlessly running the same predictable patrol routes. So tactics grew, strategies matured, and map knowledge was maximized. Mining objectives turned into mining routes to objectives, which turned into mining predicted routes to predicted objectives. Okay! <laughs> The laser beam originating from a mine forces a spy to expose themselves or funnels them into fewer routes, and exploding mines function just as well as alarms as they do as weapons. Meanwhile, the Merc's cam network overlooks spy spawns and entrances. Checking that during the critical seconds after a new spy spawns in can cut their possible known locations in half. Aiming at spies with the scope hacks their comms, and standing still activates a natural Merc night vision too. The objective placement may be designed to force mercs to always be rotating, but the mercs' toolset, accuracy spread, and vision options encourage them to stand still and lie in wait. So, with the right spots mined with the right entrances guarded, the spies can suddenly feel like they're the ones with clunky limited mobility, turning the whole setup on its head. How do you break this stalemate? With team games, coordinate with your partner. A friend can bail you out of just about anything, because with only two players on either team, all the other guy has to do is basically walk in the light to create a distraction. The two-player team creates a situation that feels less like you're on a team and more like you're a dynamic duo of synchronized thinking. Each player's chosen location is a big commitment, and both spies and mercs are doubly effective at combat when they're in the room together. The decision of when and where you two decide to prioritize combat or map coverage is a brilliantly difficult decision that's weighed against each player's own sense of temptation and absent-mindedness. Pulling off a successful plan feels amazing, especially because some of the craziest things you can think of actually work. But being able to pull one off and get that feeling requires a lot of ropes to be learned in some of the most unintuitive ways possible. In a white-knuckle online action game like this where every second counts, the old canned animation system not matching up with your intentions can feel devastating. And putting up with that, and the seemingly endless angst from players who never wanted to play as mercs, really stunted the direction the series went down later. Starting with mercs having remote explosive drones and ending with the spies just being flat out given a gun. But I think a modern remake of 2005's version of the game could still work out nowadays somehow. You've got all the ingredients for extensive accessibility and tutorials in here, they just weren't implemented back then. Added UI features to make things easier to read would make a little standalone Spies vs. Mercs spin-off fit right in with today's ecosystems of mechanically demanding and competitive team matchups. We've got squids versus kids, Genjis versus Hanzos, Breachers versus Roamers. It's time to have Batman versus Paul Blarts again. Let's do it. <laughs> Because the other guy is like on the bottom, bottom. Oh shit! No, he's not. He's right next to us. Keep, Keep going. going. Okay, running. 